Okay, thank you everyone uh, for coming to the session today. My name is Lou Tucker. I'm a VP and CTO of cloud computing at Cisco Systems. And I thought today it would be interesting to look at how one company, Cisco Systems, sort of adopted OpenStack, how we got involved. And so maybe you can draw from this uh, some of the experiences that we've had that will allow you to bring OpenStack into your own company. Um, and so I, I want to be able to also uh, show off some of the technologies that we're using and where OpenStack is being taken by the different business units within Cisco and hopefully leave time for at least a question or two at the end. So we very much believe that OpenStack is where the standard is being defined. As you can imagine, Cisco has been very involved with a lot of standards bodies over the years. And now we see open source really coming into the fore as being a place where we can develop these through code and then share them with the rest of the community. And so we participated in the very first OpenStack Design Summit in Austin. You've, you've seen the graphs of, of how those things have grown every time. Uh, it's great to see 6,000 people here. It's great to actually see a number of faces here that I recognize from previous summits. So I think that we all should be very proud of what we've been doing. And so this is when we launched and got involved with the foundation itself. I also serve as vice chairman of the foundation. And that's been a rewarding experience because as we see all of the different companies, vendors and customers and users, getting together to define how we are going to evolve this platform and solving the issues that we see that are present in the marketplace. You know, to win anything, you've got to play. I mean, you've got to make a bet. And at the time in 2010 when we were looking at this, this was not an obvious bet. And for a company like Cisco, it was certainly not obvious why Cisco should be involved in, in an open source community such as this. But we made the bet. And what you can see is that then you can talk a lot about how do you affect change within an organization. You have to be able to start with that. We started with a very, very small team. We set ourselves up to actually have a very large number of friends and family, people in the rest of Cisco. Cisco's got 70,000 people in it. We were a very small team, half a dozen people, and we had many, many other engagements uh, with other participants from the rest of Cisco getting involved. And that friends and family, I think, was a really important uh, aspect of getting that change. We also had to understand the differences between open source and proprietary software. And that's where I think that we're seeing real resurgence of interest in open source. I was just actually at Onog in New York debating open source versus closed source. And I felt kind of sorry for actually Charlie Jane Collar, who was taking the proprietary side, because he had to defend proprietary software. But the best we could come up with was that when you have the developer community like this, open source is the preferred model. This is how we can really get the innovations and get the brightest people on the planet working together on something like this. That again, we are all in businesses. And so you have to be able to show the relevance to the business to do this, and then be able to rapidly track technology trends. This is moving faster than anything else I know today. And so you have to be able to be very agile and move quickly uh, as the technology changes and as the marketplace changes. So in fact, if you look at where we've been making contributions, we're primarily known for our contributions in bringing in neutron networking into OpenStack. But again, it's, it's larger than that. It's being able to be expand into a lot of different areas here where you can see now we're focusing a lot on containers and making containers a viable alternative to virtual machines running in an OpenStack environment. Um, IPv6 is very important. And so we're making a lot of contributions, core contributions there in terms of how IPv6 would be made available to every, everybody. In addition then, there's other things in terms of Kafka and how big data pipelines are being able to be used. And we can see a lot of transitions, different, different parts of the industry are moving to OpenStack. And so the use cases are exploding and we're finding the right projects to be able to bring forward that kind of technology. So it always about innovation. And here's just a couple of innovations that, that we've come out of my, my team at Cisco. And one of the interesting things, these actually again started as very small projects, often by interns. Uh, that we allowed them to go off and do something, such as curvature, and what we're doing with analytics. And we also noticed that there was a real lack of performance benchmarking. How many of you really know the performance of your cloud? We didn't have many tools which would allow you to measure performance. So we've been contributing those. And in each case, we've been working on this technology and developing it in the open, making it a broader 
than just what our own use case was going to be because we can get the rest of the community involved in it. So for example, in the predictive analytics and, and visualization, these are large scale systems we're dealing with. And the traditional management tools just don't cut it. You have to have alternative ways of visualizing the information and visualizing the data. So this is where I find it particularly intriguing because a lot of new developers who are not very deep into infrastructure know an awful lot about how to do visualization. They know how to build web apps and web services. And that can be readily built on top of this. Recently, we also started to discover, as we're putting more and more projects on top of OpenStack, we're putting, as we will see in, in this talk here, some of our video assets and mobility assets. What they want to know first and foremost, does the cloud work? Is what, before they're launching their application, does the, are the services there that they need and they, they can rely on? And what are the performance guarantees they can uh, realize on top of OpenStack? So we came up with something called Cloud Pulse. And I think of this as, you know, this is a health check. This is something that would, would allow us to look constantly at the cloud, all of the services, a lot of different metrics in an open and an extensible way, so you could add in your own monitors. And this, uh, might, I want to actually think about this as having sound, because if you can just sit there and you're hearing a beep, the cloud's still alive. That's good. So I think there's a lot of these things that we're seeing coming into, into the forefront again. Uh, for example, with Ceph. There's an awful lot of information in Ceph about how uh, the data is distributed across the different, different uh, Ceph nodes. You want to be able to look at that, and you want to be able to know when those different critical points are being met. So dashboards are becoming very important into that realm. <coughs> Excuse me. So of course, the stats is what everybody looks at. And so when you look at like num number of blueprints, number of, of contributors in terms of lines of code, those are all important, but, but the most important thing I want to stress is that this represents a total commitment, is that it's not just putting in your own code, it's helping other developers with theirs. So the first advice I give anybody who's new to OpenStack is before you submit your first line of code, review five others. If you start that process of reviewing other people's code, the whole community will move faster, and guess what, you will then have people willing to review your code. We are very much of a social organization, and it starts with this review. So I look, most importantly, how many reviews. And we have some of, the t some of our reviewers are in their top three or four of the reviewers in the community. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do you go about driving change within an organization? First, you have to really understand what you're trying to do. And one of the first things we did was to get an application. That first application was WebEx. Many of you know that application. And, and you saw that that was one of the first user stories that we had up on in the OpenStack community. The other thing is you have to learn from your customers. So Comcast was an early customer of ours. And instead of saying, here's OpenStack, and throwing it over the wall to them, we worked with them. We said, we'll help you become part of the community. So that not only are we giving them technology and assistance, but then they were becoming active contributors. And the result of that, you're seeing now Mark Buell up on the stage today. You're seeing that, that Andrew Mitri and his team is actually launching X1 and Xfinity on top of OpenStack. And they also were some of the core contributors into the IPv6 arena. So this is how you really want to work with your customers. This is the co-development that we see with our customers. And that's the way Cisco likes to work. And I think that it's successful for you folks as well. Sorry, I should have built this out. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing is that you do have to work with your field and the different business units. Do not underestimate the amount of education you have to do within your company. They are going to be approaching you at all different levels. Some people will know an awful lot and want to get very involved. Others will think, oh, OpenStack, you install it just like you would an app on your iPhone. So there's an awful lot of effort that you have to, to pay attention to and to try to work with each of the different business units that you have so that they really understand what OpenStack is and set their expectations accordingly. What you also should be doing in that is recruiting other developers. This is about a community developed software. We need more people developing software. We need more people contributing to this. 
so that always as you're engaging others within your teams, use that mantra to get them involved so that they can actually be self-sufficient. And it also, you know, it takes a village. And so one of the things we've been trying to do over the last four years is building an internal community within Cisco. So it's not just my own team, but also we've been having a, a summit that we hold within Cisco where we actually share our best practices. It also allows people who have been working in very distant parts of the company on OpenStack to get recognized for that because we did it just like everything else. They've got sessions, we had papers contributed, we had reviews of that, and then we posted everything back internally online for, for the long tail of the content that was produced from that. And we're gonna do that every six months. I expect it to get bigger every six months that we do that. We also have, you know, it's important, people have talked about change, to get your executives supporting this. So we went to our executives and we filmed them talking about OpenStack. And so we end up with this. This is a large now conversation taking place within Cisco by the, the leading executives of the company. This goes a long, long way when you're trying to convince other parts of the company to work with you and adopt OpenStack. <coughs> so we did have our first internal summit uh, at Cisco. Uh, and we had over 400 uh, people attend over 30 different business units. I was personally surprised. I didn't know about all of the uses of OpenStack within Cisco. And it's growing every day. So this was a great way for us to be able to, to model it after this larger community summit that we have internally within the company. And this will be then an ongoing event that we have every six months. We also have our own developer conference, Cisco Live. And this is the number of tracks that we have in sessions that we're talking to Cisco's developer community. And this, I think, is a very important way because each one of us have either our own communities or our own industries that we're working in. And this is a way to actually bring OpenStack in, out into those communities. So when we look across OpenStack at Cisco today, we can see it's not one is that we have it's being used as a cloud within our IT services and things like that. We also have made big announcements about InterCloud. This is a global network of clouds from, with our service provider partners that we are federating into an InterCloud framework so that now through that kind of alliance, businesses were able to get services in geographically dis distributed areas around the world on a common OpenStack platform. We also have big pushes right now into NFV. Obviously, that's a big interest to Cisco and a lot of our, our, our partners. Something called Cloud VPN, which is being able to provide network, virtualized network services on top of an OpenStack cloud. WebEx became Spark, and the Spark application now is running fully on top of, of OpenStack today. What I wanted to do in the remaining time, though, is to, is to go on and talk about one of those use cases, which is in the video space. So if I can now ask uh, Gaurav Rishi to come up I think we can go over how OpenStack is being used to support our video. Thanks, Lou. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lou. So um, like Lou said, there was a small bet made, which actually has grown over time. And uh, one of the bets was actually in the context of media and entertainment. So in the spirit of sort of uh, learnings and, and, and teachings, I think what I really wanted to do was in the brief time I have, talk about sort of the why uh, as a business unit we decided to sort of look at OpenStack and kind of share a little bit of our journey. And then I'll also uh, invite a couple of our colleagues to come and actually show it to you. And we have a um, you know, live uh, demo, if you will, in our booth. So you know, this would be a good way to get and see it. Um, so if you look at media and entertainment, so this is your service providers as well as your media companies. Um, now, they, they, there are many things happening in that ecosystem. And you know, I, I've kind of gone to different conferences and focused on different types. But today, I think we just talk about, all right, what does cloud mean in this context? And uh, how, as Cisco and OpenStack, do we sort of contribute and sort of uh, take our customers forward on that? So if you look at it, um, you know, if you take a step back, and this was sort of uh, maybe to some extent an, you know, an evolution, which is what is the problem today? I mean, what are you trying to solve from a business perspective? So you know, if you look at the proverbial stack, if you will, uh, today almost everybody thinks they're a unicorn as far as an application is concerned. There is a static sort of siloed application. Maybe it's an encoding application. Maybe it's an origin server. And they use a particular type of compute um, you know, network or a 
storage resource. And um, the organizations, as, as Lou said, are also siloed even in, within our customers. So a lot of time when you want to go ahead and interlink these little functions together, actually it's a very manual process. You do see people sort of you know, passing Excel files uh, to and fro just to kind of create these uh, linkages. So they're not truly dynamic. And out of that, Ultimately, as you see, and you see it in the uh, you know, keynote uh, discussions today, there, there is a fast pace of innovation or a faster pace of innovation in terms of the experiences that you are, as a consumer, expecting. So it's, whether it's multi-screen uh, video, whether it's you know, time shift TV, whether it's cloud DVR, or whether it's live to what. I mean, I could, I could sort of you know, go on and about that. But the point is, the pace of innovation there is changing. And um, you know, what ends up happening, uh, which is good news for some of our services uh, colleagues, is that especially when you have multi-vendors, it turns out to be a complex service integration project where you kind of have these uh, um, you know, silo pieces, like I said, and just bringing them together not only is slow, it's also, it's also uh, you know, pricey. So, so that was actually really the business problem which uh, made us take a step back and say, well, we've been in this business for a long time, and we've probably been guilty of uh, you know, producing some of this stuff. How do we go ahead and actually fix it? So, so I think, um, again, it's, it's not a magic bullet or a silver bullet where we kind of go ahead and sort of fix one thing. It's about going ahead and sort of looking at it holistically. So, so the three or four key points I'll just sort of quickly make is, one is I think we wanted a programmable infrastructure. I think OpenStack was very little debate, frankly, from our perspective. Uh, you kind of look at the ecosystem around you. It was uh, very much... Uh, you know, given that, hey, look, uh, we want something where we can actually go ahead and quickly, if needed, uh, tweak the underlying infrastructure, optimize it for video, because if you really talk to the people who were doing, uh, you know, video development for the last 15 years, they would say, look, we are special. I mean, you know, we can't handle the jitter that uh, is expected uh, of, you know, these legacy qualm devices, and you still want us to go ahead and deliver video there. So we wanted the ability to be able to go and make the tweaks if we needed to, whether it's the storage part or whether it's the delivery aspects of it. The next step actually came up to be the actual application functions. And so uh, Lou mentioned sort of NFVs. We like to be special, so we call them VVFs, which are just video virtual functions, but it's basically the same thing. And uh, essentially what we said was, let's go ahead and rethink about how do we think about encoding in this context, and how do we make them modular enough and also pluggable enough so that we can actually now quickly software these applications so that you can use workflows or orchestration and heat templates to go ahead and actually very quickly get to the next step, which is actually the services that our customers or their customers in turn really care about, because that's, that's really what generates revenue. And um, there were other fundamental sort of uh, you know, takeaways we had as we, as we started getting into this journey, which was essentially, you know, for security, for ex example, was something that was typically endpoint security. And we've you know, invested a lot of money, both organically and inorganically in that. But once you sort of move your ecosystem over to an inter-cloud infrastructure where you're moving workloads and dynamically provisioning uh, origin servers or encoders, like I said, or packagers, you need to be thinking about security from a completely different context. And that has to be um, vertically integrated. So, so that's something that you'll uh, continue to see us sort of evolve on. And um, I think when you talk about it in the context of zooming in uh, further, I think there is a lot of talk about here in terms of containers. So I, I mean, I just want to sort of distinguish here we're talking about sort of logical applications, but I think you can join the dots very quickly to figure out how, how this is sort of going about. So when I talked about network function virtualization, or VVFs as I call them, each one of those functions that you talk about, when we think about evolving them, and this could be a, for a completely different, uh, you know, I'm talking about media and entertainment, but I'm fairly sure it's applicable to a lot of other, other segments. Each one of these functions now, in our context, we said, look, let's look at the next wave of modern application frameworks. Think about these applications actually as, as functions which can sort of scale horizontally. Uh, they are stateless. You can go ahead and actually soft wire them using these media workflow aspects of it. And by soft chaining them in different permutations and combinations, or maybe um, you know, the chain of one going and feeding another one, ends up creating sort of live workflows. So if you have live, what are you doing? You're just taking content in, you're encoding it, probably applying some DRM, doing some packaging for different types of devices. But now when somebody says, well, I also want to so solve cloud DVR, you're doing a lot of that, but you're also adding this new step of going ahead and storing it and being able to record the content and then play it out and maybe reformat it in a different way. So you end up reusing a lot of these components, but what was broken in the previous model was organizations, first of all, were not ready, and then the product itself in terms of being able to take these functions and software wasn't. 
And so this gives you a construct to sort of get there. So, um, so you, you know, there, there is a lot more to it, but what I wanted to do was maybe bring in um, my colleague Saravnan, who's actually got uh, some of this working. Uh, we invite you to sort of come and see this at the Cisco boot. But uh, let, me, let me ask him to sort of give you a quick uh, view in terms of the challenges that we faced and uh, some of the resolutions. Be great. Also, explain what cloud DVR is. I think that we talk oh, about I, it, but <laughs> I think that the audience yeah, so let me take, thinks actually, of a DVR uh, on their own. Can I have a quick show of hand? How many are from media and entertainment as a, as, as a oh, this is fantastic, very few. So that's great. Uh, so let me, let's me, uh, let me talk a little more. Uh, so, so, you know, so think about, uh, I think DVR is something that uh, probably 35% of the households have. And so when you talk about cloud DVR, it's taking that same functionality, but moving your storage into the cloud. Now, why video we think is still special is because if you think in terms of bandwidth or in terms of storage, the uh, amount of uh, volume is, is huge. I mean, as, as, as an industry, I think that's where a lot of the requirements get driven out of. So cloud DVR is taking that functionality. The advantages, of course, are you get uh, you know, geo-independence. You could be watching this instead of watching the seaplanes land, uh, your content that you've loaded. Also, you can go ahead and actually um, um, you know, get, get to watch it on any kind of device, right? So, so that, that's a given. Now, if I take the next level of um, you know, peak under from a technology perspective, you typically break it up in terms of data plane and control plane. So data plane is the heavy functions where you actually touch the video content. You might be encoding it. There's a lot of bits moving around. You might be actually going ahead and repurposing it to kind of go ahead and insert an advertisement which is sort of uh, very much uh, you know, local to you. And control plane are functions which are essentially where you don't really touch the data path per se, but you, are, you need it essentially to go ahead and make sure that you are the authorized person to be able to record a particular piece of content. Or when you schedule something, it goes and sets up a little timer inside to say, all right, I need to make X number of copies of this program for this user. So, so there is a logical separation. And I think when you think about from an implementation perspective, of course, the requirements that you, know, you need from your underlying infrastructure and functions are very different. And finally, the third piece of getting this cloud DVR together is the client device. You know, so ultimately, as a consumer, you're seeing this cool user experience. You want to be able to not get bogged down between um, you know, scrolling through a, a linear guide and get recommendations, et cetera. And that's sort of the client device. And um, you know, these are the three key components which actually end up making that solution. So, so with that said, hopefully that's sort of the quick primer on sort of just the solution. But um, with that said, let me sort of uh, very quickly ask us. Why don't we take questions at the end? Oh, all right, yeah. yeah. If, if you can wait for a few Go minutes. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Um, Lou talked about uh, uh, all, the, all the different business units inside Cisco are working together now to actually bring in a lot of applications on, to run on top of OpenStack. One application, obviously, we were talking about is the cloud DVR and other media applications that we are porting from a hardware-centric to a software-centric applications, and also getting them ready to run on OpenStack. Right? That, that's the key thing that we are actually focusing on as far as one use case is concerned, which is, which is Videoscape as such and, and all the media applications. Right? So when we actually brought in all the applications, hardware-centric applications, and virtualized them, that is the first step that we did. And the next step is virtualized applications have to be cloudified. Right? All, not all virtualized applications are cloud ready. You, know, you have to make a lot of changes internally at the app level to make sure that they are ready for, to be run on cloud. So, In fact, if I might just interject here, a couple of weeks ago there's a National Association of Broadcasters meeting in, in, in Vegas. Big show, lots of big screens and flashing video around and everything. This is where all of the major video producers' content meet. That's where the industry meets. It's an industry that's been driven by hardware appliances. So everywhere you go, there's specialized pieces of hardware, whatever, for encoding, transcoding, ingest, and everything else. There's two kinds of customer, two kinds of vendors there now. One kind, about two years ago, they recognized something's going on here in cloud computing, and they can start to virtualize those. They had an aha moment. There's the other companies that are sitting there with their hardened hardware appliances, and they're having an oh shit moment. <laughs> because they're going, this is coming, and I'm not ready for it. So I think we're going to see this. We've talked about disruption. Jonathan talked about it this morning. This is an example of a whole industry now being disrupted by cloud computing. Yep. So I'm just going to take one slide to explain to you all the challenges as a video application team we faced when we ported all the video applications into OpenStack. And uh, as the slide deck shows, we have a live working demo. 
in our booth where you can come and experience the, uh, the, the video applications running on OpenStack, live streaming, cloud DVR, WAD, and all the use cases, which used to be dedicated, run on dedicated hardware. Now it's virtualized, and it's cloudified, and it's running on OpenStack. So j just a quick challenge is obviously multicast routing was, was a big challenge for us to get multicast routing working on OpenStack. Um, storage challenges, obviously, uh, Gaurav was talking about all these storage, unique storage requirements for running video applications on OpenStack. It's, it's pretty key. So what, we, what Cisco did to actually address the storage challenges, we'll talk about that. Complex multi-VM with uh, all the service level agreement, right? Video applications come with their own unique requirements. One application has a lot of memory requirements. One application has a lot of memory come um, processing requirements. One come with storage requirements. Putting them all together in a work stack, in a, in a workflow, and running them in a cloud environment is pretty challenging. So we had to come up with very, very unique innovations in, inside, the, inside the development team to actually run it on OpenStack. Security requirements, obviously, when you deal with content, everybody knows the, the, the strict content or uh, content requirements and security requirements around handling uh, data in, in the cloud, right? And obviously, content affinity requirements. When you're dealing with content, you, cannot, you have s certain geographic requirements where you cannot push content from one cloud to another cloud so easily as you push other data, right? So, so what we did, right? So we had to actually bring in multicast routing into the cloud, into the OpenStack environment. We came up with plugins, the ML2 plugin to get over to open to get OpenStack ready for multi-stack. Uh, sorry, multicast routing. And then we actually innovated in the storage area. We took the Swift stack, enhanced the Swift stack, added some extensions for media-ready extensions. Right. So these Swift stack extensions made us. To, to actually work with the storage open source object store community to get that extensions added so you can actually do video applications on top of open source object stores. Um, uh, complex multi-VM with SLA, so, so we, <coughs> we use uh, Silometer, we use heat templates for actually orchestrating these multi-complex virtualized, uh, virtualized machines to actually integrate them, service chain them together to get video applications running on OpenStack. And uh, security requirements, obviously, there is a lot of security requirements. We enhanced our cloud service router to actually run in an open stack environment to provide the, the content owners the, the, the capability to run multi-tenancy video applications in an open stack cloud environment. And uh, obviously, we have intercloud that Lou was talking about. To scale, to scale cloud DVR, for example, you want to scale cloud DVR at some point from one data center to another data center, you can interconnect the clouds between together using intercloud application that Cisco is coming together, federate them and interconnect them when you need scale, and then scale down when you don't need the scale. So we are doing all these kinds of innovation to get video applications running on OpenStack. So some of the challenges I've listed. So okay. now I yeah. okay. Thank you very much. I think that that's just, that's just one example. We could have brought up here, you know, mobile packet core. Uh, like we said, many of the uh, network function virtualization areas. There's a lot of different parts of Cisco now that is moving on to OpenStack. And I, what I really wanted to do with this video team was show that they really chose to use as much of the component tree they could in OpenStack without having to sort of go off and then ba basically do their own. So the last, last topic I just wanted to, to discuss here is that uh, like many companies, we have a very large developer community, and one way we reach those is through the web. And so I wanted to now talk about how we've set up within the developer community, Cisco developer community, DevNet, on uh, Cisco's uh, website, a special community for OpenStack. And what we're trying to do there, much, much, mo most importantly, is instead of trying to put all the content there is to be a, re a repository for links back into the community. We want to always drive people back into the community. All of the uh, contributions we've made are on GitHub and associated with it. So we're really not trying to capture content there. Instead, make this a reference source for people to go back into the community. And I would urge other companies to use that same kind of model. This is also a place where we plan on experimenting. And so that's why a lot of the innovations that we've shown earlier are, are showing up on this site today. And if I can get Rohit to come up today, uh, perhaps he can walk us through what this is. Sure. If you want, maybe I can. Let's get to the browser. Yep. Uh, so, so we, we 
as Lou talked about, and we had a good example of a solution. So the idea of the DevNet program is to enable our customers, as well as partners, to find information uh, so that they can quickly get started with some of the technical stuff that they're dealing with. Uh, so we have concept around dev centers, which are around uh, major technology areas. So we have, like, example here, a cloud dev center that we have opened up. Uh, and within that, we have built upon a specific microsite that is dedicated for OpenStack. So within the uh, Cloud Dev Center here, we have the OpenStack microsite. So the microsite here is dedicated uh, to provide all of the contributions that we have provided within the community. Uh, so if I go into the OpenStack projects at Cisco, uh, the, these include all of the plugin and drivers, pointers to the GitHub re repos. Uh, so this is one of the challenges that we see from our customers that, great, you're making so many contributions, but how do I really get to know a consolidated view of all the integrations that you have done? So the first table, for example, lists all the uh, product integrations with Cisco. And the second, some of the things that Lou talked about, the incubated projects, uh, the AirVos, VMTP, and we have a few more that we have released, for example, Cloud Pulse. Uh, so we will be adding information about all of this here so our customers can go back and look at this information and make a sound decision in terms of what they want to integrate in their OpenStack environment. Um, some of the other technical information that we are contributing is in terms of technical briefs. Uh, so, for example, Neutron IPv6, uh, a very important feature within Kilo release. Uh, Cisco has been actively implementing a lot of blueprints uh, within the Kilo release. And the Neutron IPv6 tech brief, which is publicly available, uh, captures all of these information that we have uh, uh, contributed. And it goes through technical details of what, uh, what every feature uh, implements within Neutron. Uh, this is something, again, we have worked with the community and with the Cisco OpenStack IPv6 experts. Um, actually, a lot of this content is, is already getting uh, reused within the OpenStack IPv6 wiki page as well as the Neutron uh, networking manual. So all of that is going through the Git review process within the community. So again, a very good example of how uh, things that we are building for our customers as well as for the community is getting uh, implemented and getting included in, in within the upstream community as well. Um, Going back to the side, um, uh, again, from, from I, I already talked about the downloads. Uh, Lou talked about some of the uh, customer events as well as Cisco Live. So we have created this video catalog where we are providing all of the sessions that are contributed by Cisco and participated by Cisco members for OpenStack-related talks uh, so that we have a reference uh, for, for other folks to look at it. Uh, so in summary, what I want to say here is that through this DevNet evangelism program, we want to make, highlight Cisco's contributions from a technical point of view as well as from a product point of view. Uh, Stackalytics and other, uh, com other sources within the community provide you that information, uh, but a lot of times it's very hard to go through all that sea of information, and we wanted to make sure that developer.cisco.com slash OpenStack is your one-point portal to find out all the involvement areas uh, with, for Cisco with OpenStack. Great, thanks. So that's why I'm really pleased to be launching this today here at the summit. And I hope this becomes a very valuable resource uh, for all of you. So I hope what we've been able to talk about today is something about how a company such as Cisco has been able to adopt OpenStack and drive it into many of our different businesses. Uh, and I think we might have time for one or, qu one or two questions. Anybody is trying to do something similar in their own company, and what are the challenges? Yep. Oh, you had a question earlier, yes. Uh, there's a mic over there because this is being recorded. You mentioned earlier that uh, Cisco worked to uh, help Comcast deploy OpenStack. I was curious in what capacity was it that DVR, cloud-based DVR? Uh, it's actually what they're showing today, which is their X1 ap Xfinity application that's running on top of OpenStack. Okay. And so we help them set up OpenStack, get them involved in, in the community. And, and a lot of the education and training and technical support around that. So that now they're a full-fledged member and we're continuing to work with them on a number of different initiatives. Yeah, uh, which team in, within Cisco is working on the um, uh, development of the group-based policy with OpenStack and uh, the L4 to L7 functionalities that are Okay. The work that I'm yeah. So actually, the group-based policy is done within a small team that's associated with uh, what we had earlier in semi acquisition, and that that is developing a lot of that. They actually are one floor above where my group is, and so we have a very close interaction with them. 
Uh, and then we also have within my team a lot of the uh, services interfaces that are going into service orchestration and things that are going into Neutron itself. But I think those of you who are interested in group-based policy, I think that will be a very interesting uh, area to watch over the next couple of years because it's a much simpler way to approach scalable applications where you, are worried, where you really are trying to express policy. And policy is, I think, the next thing in software that we really are trying to find ways to use policy to drive these things. So we get out of configuring things and setting up ports and everything else, which is just cause for errors. Yes. Hi, I work for a huge telco in Brazil, and we approached Cisco back in 2013. And uh, we were presented with the, lots of technologies from Cisco. Basically, we bought a, a bunch of V-blocks, uh, Cisco Nexus and stuff. And still, today, if you take a look, if you uh, contact a, a Cisco salesperson, or if you take a look at what Cisco is doing in terms of marketing, if you don't pay close attention, probably we're going to end up having an idea of Cisco being MetaCloud, probably a tail F. Still, what you guys, your particular group that you mentioned, are doing in order to get Cisco as, yep. a, as a company aware of, uh, you know, this multiple so I things? Yeah, I mentioned you know, any large company, as I'm sure you're aware, we have a very large field sales force, and educating particularly around the globe is, has its challenges. But I, but I think for everybody here, it's important to understand where Cisco's emphasis is. First is in terms of driving the overall OpenStack community. We very much believe in this platform and where it needs to go. So we are, and that's where my group is a rather substantial group within Cisco. We're driving a lot of those core contributions back into that. Out of that team, we're also working with each one of our, with a smaller set of customers, like I'd mentioned with Comcast and others, where we are having direct engineering to customer engagements. Because OpenStack is very difficult sometimes for customers to do on their own. You know, then we have the InterCloud initiative, which is where we are setting up a global network of OpenStack clouds. And, and our MetaCloud acquisition was an interesting one because we recognize that for many companies who do not have the engineering expertise in-house, they would prefer to basically have a private cloud as a service. So have a company such as Cisco come in, build a private cloud, Cisco manages it and operates it, and the IT organization just uses it. It's like having their own captive um, I, uh, you know, um, AWS in-house. In and so those are the three areas, really. One is in terms of the contributions and working with our customers. The second is in terms of InterCloud. And the third is, is that private cloud as a service today. OK, two more minutes, so maybe one more question. Or if not, I know the room is really hot. We can, um, <laughs> OK, I, let, let's do this. Uh, I will be here or right outside in the hallway, uh, as will the other presenters or whatever. And I appreciate your attendance today. Thank you very much.